So thank you and, and welcome back. Um, we had a, a very full day yesterday uh, and we, we covered a lot of ground and I want to thank you uh, for, uh, for being there yesterday and for continuing today. Uh, today uh, we have one more panel and then we're going to turn to you uh, to help us in thinking about what we've learned uh, from the last two days and helping us to set uh, the agenda uh, for a research agenda at UMass, but hopefully for many of our partners as well, we're hoping uh, may find it of interest in terms of thinking about uh, these issues of bridging uh, religious divides, both globally and locally here. Um, I think uh, we covered a lot of ground yesterday. We went from the State Department and U.S. foreign policy uh, to Nigeria, uh, back to Boston with the Bridges process, uh, and then to Israel-Palestine, uh, looking at Neve Shalom and other activities, uh, bridging gaps there. And then yesterday evening as well, we, some of us heard from our chancellor uh, talking about things here at UMass Boston. Uh, I think a key thing to remember again are the goals for the conference are to first and foremost uh, to think about key learning. Uh, what are the key themes that you're hearing over the course of these different panels? And then second, uh, and just as important, are charting a path for this research agenda. Uh, what are the questions that you are wrestling with um, in the work that you do or from what you're hearing uh, from the panelists that need to be answered? Uh, what is something that academic institutions need to be spending their time uh, going deeper with research on, but also questions for practitioners uh, that need to be addressed on what can be done? What is the new frontiers in a very, very old subject? Uh, and one that has been well researched and well looked at, uh, but in a world that is changing quickly and that we need to try to keep up with and to think about. And so I'm particularly excited about this panel uh, where as conference um, uh, organizers, uh, you have the distinct privilege of, uh, of getting to invite some of your heroes in the field to hear them come talk about and to wrestle with some of these difficult questions. Uh, so I'm really excited about our distinguished panel, and I would like to turn over uh, to David Smock of the U.S. Institute of Peace, who will moderate this panel this morning. Thank you, and welcome back. Thank you, Darren. It's a privilege for me to be moderating a panel with a group of old friends, or I should say friends of long acquaintance rather than old <laughs> friends. Uh, and We'll start off with Joyce Dubinsky, who is the CEO of the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding. Joyce? Thank you. Um, I was going to do this from my seat. Can you hear me if I stand from my seat? OK. Um, well, when Darren asked me to speak, he asked me to talk about two of my favorite things. One is Tannenbaum, and the other is to give all my opinions about what I think is important. So that's what you're going to get today. The three things we'll cover is to give you an overview of what we do at Tannenbaum, some of the lessons learned. That includes our strengths, of course, which I'll brag about, and our weaknesses, which I'll concede, and some of my thoughts about where we need to go and what some of the things that we need to be doing. So starting at the beginning, I looked at the description of this session, and I need to tell you what Tannenbaum is not. We are not an interfaith organization, but we do work across faiths, and we do work with people of all beliefs, including no belief. We are not focused on religious conflicts, but we are focused on religious peacemakers, individuals who are motivated by their faith to work for peace. <coughs> and we're not a dialogic group although we recognize dialogue as a tool that needs to be used and recognize communication as a key asset and a key skill set in all of our work. So what is Tannenbaum? Well, we're an organization that's focused on combating religious prejudice. Uh, we're non-sectarian and secular. We don't promote religion or denigrate it but our focus is working on the power of religion in our lives. So we have two trajectories in which we work. One is working on the ways that our beliefs intersect daily life 
and cause conflicts, and designing different strategies for reducing those tensions. And that's in schools, where we do anti-bullying work and peace education. It's in workplaces, where people of all different beliefs need accommodation. And it's in healthcare, where people, because of their religious beliefs, often don't get the same care as others. And we work to make sure they do. But the other area of our work, and the one we're going to discuss today, is our work in conflict resolution. Um, and that's our work with um, religiously motivated peacemakers, and it's our international program. So what is that? Well, Tannenbaum identifies individuals from around the world who are religiously <coughs> motivated. We do that by setting five criteria and then having a, a, a worldwide nomination process every two years and sending the finalists to our advisory council, which includes Doug Johnson, forever. Um, and also Andre. Um, so we, we do that. See, so this is a team. Uh, the five criteria, religiously motivated, working in an armed conflict, doing some work at the local level, um, being relatively unknown at the time they're selected, and having their lives with freedom at risk. So Imam Ashafa, who is one of our peacemakers, was one day relatively unknown, but now we all know him. Today, Tannenbaum has identified 28 peacemakers in action. They come from 21 conflicts. Uh, of those people, uh, four have died, but we continue on, and we work with the peacemakers. We do really three things now. We give them an award. That's the beginning stage. Then we analyze their work. We analyze who they are, how they do it, and the techniques that they use. So this book, Peacemakers in Action, was our first attempt to do that. And we'll have a second book coming out on additional uh, peacemakers early next year. Um, we also do what we call professional development. We have working retreats when we bring the peacemakers together. There are a lot of reasons for those working retreats. Um, they're intensive eight-day sessions where our peacemakers come together <clears throat> and they develop community, they share information, and they train each other in their techniques. And we also now, and that's the newest part of our program, work with them as an official network, the Peacemakers in Action Network, designed to have a worldwide impact through collaborations that are targeted. The network was actually created by the peacemakers. At our third retreat, one of our peacemakers, Bill Lowry, said, you know, we call ourselves a network, but we're not. We're really just a group of people who come together every couple of years because Tannenbaum brings us together. But to be a network, we have to have more of a commitment to what we can share and do together. And do we want to do that? And we took a vote to explore it. It was a unanimous vote to explore it. And we spent over two years doing that with our peacemakers. And then we went back at our next retreat and said, do we want to be a network? And the plan that was presented was changed and adapted in that week. And at the end of that week, the Peacemakers in Action became an official network that, with their own leadership group, facilitated by Tannenbaum. And I would say it's truly a community of practice where there is shared learning. One of the goals is to do mutual support with one another. And they are now in regular contact. But beyond that, it's to do these targeted interventions. One was done in Nigeria, actually before the network um, was formalized, when um, uh, Pastor James and Imam Ashafa brought three of our peacemakers, who they selected because they knew them and they knew they would make a difference, um, and brought them to Nigeria before the last set of elections in an effort to keep people from going to war. And they did a lot of targeted uh, efforts, including training in some key cities of women and youth, as well as public communications 
that make a difference in a country that is deeply religious and cares about the voice of religious leaders. We just finished one working with Syrians uh, and with our Syrian peacemaker as well. So that's what Tannenbaum does. Lessons learned? Well, the first is one that I think we'd all agree on, the power of the religious actor to make peace. There is real power in the person perceived to be religiously driven or who is clergy and a religious leader. I think of, there are a lot of stories, but one very quick one in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Bishop Mutambu. Um, he was involved in a lot of building up of his community and trying to stabilize it when he was asked to work with the Mahi Mahi for a peace conference and to create it. He was able to get someone to the chief and the Mahi Mahi agreed to participate. Now, you probably know, or maybe you don't, that they have readopted their indigenous traditions and that includes cannibalism and the chief wears testicles in his hair. Uh, his armed uh, convoy came to the bishop's house. His wife was there. I asked her what she did. She said, I ran away, I went to a neighbor. But Bishop Natambo stayed, and he came out of his home, and the men came out of their car with their um, machine guns, and then out came the chief. And he walked over to Bishop Natambu, and he bent down on one knee, and he said, Father, will you bless me? And he did, and then he invited him into his home, because one of his techniques is what we would call radical hospitality, and that, in fact, made a difference in the outcome of that peace negotiation. Um, the peacemakers, other things learned, these religious peacemakers are everywhere, but they are under-recognized. We tend not to see them always or to know how to identify them. We need a broad definition to do so. Another learning is both the importance of language and the challenge of language. Tannenbaum's program is about conflict resolution. Well, that was the name we gave it when we started our work 15 years ago. Since then, I've been challenged why we don't call it conflict transformation. Peace building, strategic peace building, peacemaking again. Why we call it conflict resolution and is that too limiting? So what I would suggest to you is while the field struggles with how to define itself. The practitioners think of religious peacemaking broadly and as those who, because of religion, can do great things. So let's not get trapped in our language. Strengths and weaknesses of what we do at Town and Bam. Here's where I get to boast. We've been adaptable. We've evolved. Early on, we realized that most of the peacemakers were men. And we started to look at that as a, a serious issue. What did we discover? We discovered that men nominated men and women nominated men. Women didn't think that their work was up to the same standards as the men in terms of risk, in terms of being um, relevant, and they were not nominating themselves. So we created a women's peace initiative targeting women. And last year, my board took an extraordinary step, and they said of every two peacemakers that we name, one has to be a woman, and the other can be a woman or a man. We actually affirmatively go out to recruit the nominations of women. We also have the same problem with people from uh, Eastern traditions. We don't know why we get almost no nominations from the East, but we think one of the reasons is because there's work in community that's done there and not individual. And so recognizing and promoting the individual doesn't fly with the culture. So we continue to pursue that. Today, our, we have Christian, Jewish, Muslim, and a Buddhist peacemaker, and we look to keep expanding that. Um, other strengths. We identify real tactics, techniques, methodologies that have worked. 
That doesn't mean they will work in every situation or every environment, but they are information for the practitioner about what might work. We've also developed the network, and we believe that this may be the crowning jewel in what we're going to be able to accomplish over the next 10 years, working with the peacemakers in these interventions as a community of practice. So those are our strengths. Now, the challenges, the weaknesses, the weaknesses, I think our, our key weakness is a lack of evaluation. Um, we can evaluate before and after a, a session. It is very hard to assess if you've made peace, because peace isn't linear and how you define it is really a construct that includes a whole lot more than the lack of war. Um, so we, our evaluative techniques are, remain to be honed, and we focus on that as much as we can. Um, a challenge for us, and one that I think is true for the entire field, is that it's under-resourced. For us, this is the way it plays out. It's hard to do our working retreats. We don't always have the resources we need. It's, we don't always have the resources for an intervention. But maybe the most serious is we don't have a fund sitting there for um, a crisis. And those crises are not only about a conflict where there can be an intervention, it's also about the lives of our peacemakers. There was a call that we got once, David may remember it, um, where Imam Ashafa needed some emergency care. It was very serious and life-threatening. And I didn't have a fund that I could tap on. All I had were the people I knew that I could start calling to see if individuals wanted to step up. That, for me, is a challenge, because our <laughs> network is not just a network. Each of the people in it are my friends and are very important to me. Um, another weakness is the lack of broad recognition of this field in our general public. And I think that's important because the field will get more support when the possibilities and the realities of this work are understood. So I think it's something that needs to be tackled. Social media was discussed yesterday. Communication, it's a theme. It's a great, important thing that needs to be done. But it's not all that needs to be done. So, what do we need to do? Well, we have theories of change at Tannenbaum for all of our programs. And in those, we try to envision that if we were really successful, if we, did, if we accomplished everything we needed to accomplish with all of our partners playing in the same sandbox, what would the world look like? And as far as I'm concerned, religiously driven peacemakers would be part of uh, the resolution of all conflicts recognized as a key resource, not the only answer, a key resource to be used, accessed, and worked with. So when I look at what we need to do, I look at that goal, that vision, and try to see what are some of the steps that'll get us there. Well, for one thing, for the peacemakers in our network, I've learned that religious peacemaking is a vocational choice. It is not something they do on the side. It is not something um, that, you know, just kind of happens. It's what they devote their lives to every single day. I think that the work of this institution and others like it uh, is beginning to create the vocational option for others to pursue this field. But we need to do that with deliberation. We need to make it a vocational option. We do that in a number of ways, through training. Not just religious leaders, students in seminaries and, and divinity schools. Yes, they can become our future religious peacemakers, and choosing that as a vocation should be just as possible as choosing um, to be a, a pulpit clergy or to be a chaplain in a hospital. But also the students of international affairs. Why? Because they're our future diplomats. They need to know about this resource. They need to know how to access it, identify it, use it. 
We also need to work with professional development for those already in the field. The beginning work at the Foreign Service Institute with the initial courses, very important. Not enough. A lot more needs to be done. Once we create that vocational option, we need employment. People do need to eat, and they do need <coughs> to find ways to be paid to do this work. That, I'm not talking about riches. I'm talking about living a life so that you can do the work. Because peacemakers need self-care just as much as the rest of us. And so how does that work? I don't have all the answers to that. I think some of it could come from government, but not all of it. But just imagine our great religious traditions, our religious institutions, starting to fund religious peace builders from within their traditions or elsewhere, <coughs> as opposed to, juxtaposed to, supporting missionaries because the work is different. Even where there's overlap, it's different. Finally, that general public uh, work. And that's so important, whether it's through TV shows, radio, books, comic books, however we get this word out, I would like kids to be able to imagine growing up to be a firefighter, a lawyer, a doctor, or a religious peacemaker. So that's what we have to do, I think. We have to build this vocation of religious peacemaking. We also, to do this, need to map our techniques. Now, Tannenbaum maps the techniques of our peacemakers. <coughs> But it just listening in the past day, what did we hear? We heard there are all these different ways that people do group work. They have specific methods that they use, questions that they ask, theories that they stand behind, approaches that they take. If they all sat side by side, if we knew about all of them, the ad adaptation that we talked about yesterday that's going on in Nigeria would be possible on a much broader scale and people would be able to take what works and imagine how to adapt it for their own communities. So that mapping research, I think, is critically important. We also need to test my premise, because the pre underlying premise of everything I've just said is that we need to, um, that we can transfer knowledge about the techniques. We need to test and evaluate whether or not this premise is correct. Finally, we need to expand um, the way we do our research. We need to use technology to document the histories and stories, not just through documentaries, but yes, through documentaries, because they're critical and they tell a story in a time frame people can capture. But also, the research we do with the peacemakers. We do intensive interviews with them at Tannenbaum. If I documented all of that on video, it would not only be useful for my research, but that would stand as an archive for researchers everywhere. And finally, one last thought before I go. I think we need to humanize our religious peacemakers. They are wonderful, heroic, but they're people with flaws. Sometimes they fall, sometimes and they do great things, and they are not always successful. So their work is critically important. It needs to be supported. We need to build it. But the only way we can do that is by also <coughs> acknowledging them as our fellow humans. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joyce. I will now turn to Douglas Johnston, who is president of the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy and one of the pioneers in this uh, field. Doug? Thank you, David. And uh, I, too, share your joy at uh, being with uh, friends and colleagues of long standing here. It's a privilege to be with all of you today. I'd like to thank uh, Darren for uh, inviting me and Ben for making it all possible. What I'd like to do is share with you uh, some lessons learned from uh, our center's involvement in what we call faith-based diplomacy. 
to uh, define that for you at the macro level, it simply means incorporating religious considerations into the practice of uh, international politics. At the micro level, it means actually making religion part of the solution in some of these intractable identity-based conflicts, ethnic conflicts, tribal warfare, religious hostilities, uh, the thing, sort of things that exceed the grasp of traditional diplomacy. Now, since our center's inception in 1999, we've been practicing this form of diplomacy in different parts of the world, starting with the north of Sudan, then Kashmir, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, uh, Syria, Saudi Arabia, and the United States. And what I'd like to do, uh, it just uh, I, as you could tell from that spectrum, uh, one of the realities that all of us face that are involved in this work is every conflict is unique. It's driven by personalities and circumstances, and those are always unique. So they require different approaches. There's no cookie-cutter approach in this business. So uh, I'd like to just cite three examples of working at different levels with people and what the lessons learned were that came out of that. First was in Sudan, where we pursued a top-down strategy. Uh, uh, at the time we went there, in 1999, um, there were any number of NGOs working the problem, but they were all in the South. Uh, trying to relieve the suffering uh, that was uh, uh, going on as a result of the conflict. We took a very different approach. We went to the north with the uh, uh, avowed purpose of establishing relationships of trust with the regime, and from that vantage point to inspire them to take steps toward peace that they wouldn't otherwise take. And we were about a uh, year and a half into that process when we had a watershed moment where we uh, brought together 30 religious leaders and scholars, uh, 10 were prominent Sudanese Muslim religious leaders, 10 were prominent Sudanese Christian religious leaders, and 10 were internationals from both faith communities. And we met for three days to deal with the religious aspects of the conflict. And uh, I could go into a lot of detail on how that took place, uh, but I would just uh, tell you that when it was over, uh, there was a genuine breakthrough in communications between the two sides. Uh, a lot of friendships were established uh, in marked contrast to the frosty silence uh, on which the uh, uh, deliberations began. And uh, there were a few things in there that I think were kind of interesting. Uh, uh, an, an elder statesman told me at the end, he said, you know, there's two things, and he says, in my limited uh, time on this earth, and he was quite old, so it wasn't that, all that limited, but he said he'd never seen a meeting where Northerners and Southerners had actually spoken to one another from the heart. And the second thing he said is he'd never seen uh, such a single concentration of intellectual horsepower as existed in that meeting on the Muslim side. Uh, that was not by accident. It was very much by design because uh, we weren't there to overthrow the regime. We weren't there to abolish Sharia law. We were there to answer a simple question. What steps could Islamic governments take in a Sharia context to alleviate the second-class status of non-Muslims? And if we could an <coughs> come up with credible answers to that, and we had highly credible people around the table on the Muslim side, then this could resonate in other parts of the world like Nigeria and Indonesia at the time who were going through similar kinds of uh, problems. <coughs> Out of that meeting, uh, there were 17 consensus recommendations, one of which was establishing an interreligious council, uh, which we did. It took us about two years to accomplish that, and um, it took another five months to uh, uh, designate the right leader for that group. Uh, who was a Muslim, but had been a constant thorn in the uh, side of the regime. Uh, but we finally did get it in place, and once uh, that got going, they did uh, a number of very concrete things to really improve the lot of, of uh, the non-Muslims in, uh, in the area. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, the leader, the executive director of that, uh, went on to uh, work with David Smock and others at the U.S. Institute of Peace doing good things. Uh, <clears throat> What are the lessons learned out of that? Well, well, one was, uh, you know, one wonders why this meeting was so successful when the run, wounds ran so deep. And I think it was because it was a genuine exercise in faith-based diplomacy. 
We began each day with uh, readings from the Bible and the Quran. We proceeded each day with a prayer breakfast between the internationals and local religious leaders. Uh, <clears throat> we took breaks for prayer time at the appropriate intervals. None of this is rocket science. But one thing that did stand out is we brought a prayer team halfway around the world from Santa Barbara, California, to pray and fast during the three and a half days of deliberations, praying for the success of those deliberations. So periodically you could see these fee people feeding in from the sidelines, listening quietly to what was going on, figuring out what needed to be prayed for and going out and praying. And uh, they were matched by a like number of Sudanese Pentecostals. And all of this, <coughs> The way it manifested itself in terms of progress was it, uh, it, it caused people to rise above themselves. Uh, so the entire proceedings were conducted in a very cordial tone, uh, which is in stark contact, contrast to what one would have expected. And uh, another piece of the faith-based diplomacy would be in my conversations with the foreign minister, for example, and so these are real politique kinds of conversations, uh, trying to persuade them that what we were suggesting was in their own best interest to do, but looking for that uh, useful moment to make a helpful reference to the Quran or uh, how the prophet might have dealt with it or what Jesus might have thought about it. And uh, no matter where you went, how hard-boiled the politician and all, when you, got, when you introduced the faith dimension, they opened up. And that has been our continuing uh, experience uh, in, in other areas as well. Uh, in terms of lessons learned, I think we proved the concept of faith-based diplomacy. Uh, but uh, on the downside, uh, we didn't have uh, sufficient resources to establish an office in, in Sudan to keep the work going while we were there, uh, while we weren't there. But uh, what did happen is that uh, uh, we didn't pay enough attention to the second and third level uh, in uh, tiers in the decision-making process because the instant we would leave town, everything would come to a screeching halt. It was just uh, paralysis would set in, and that was because the second and third tier decision-makers thought that what we were doing was going to be at their expense, uh, the Muslims' expense. And uh, to some extent, one could make that case, but if one thought more deeply about it, it actually works the reverse. But that was the lesson learned. You know, if you go top down, make sure you, you, you go down a little further than just at the top. Uh, a second case was in Kashmir. There we were uh, working from the middle out uh, because there was absolute political gridlock at the top. The only reason we were there was that uh, I was concerned that it was the nuclear flashpoint in the world and nobody was doing anything at the time. So what we did was we worked with uh, what we call next generation leadership. You know, these are folks who are probably in their 40s, uh, lawyers, journalists, uh, college professors, people who were on their way up. But we sought to establish a cooperative relationship between the Hindu, uh, Buddhist, and Muslim uh, regions of Kashmir and worked six years at that, and we did achieve that. Uh, we did it through uh, using an instrument we call uh, a faith-based reconciliation seminar. And these are seminars that go for several days, during which we cause people to go very deep in looking hard at their own uh, perspectives and attitudes and how those mix with others in the other groups uh, that we're worried about. And um, we deal, we, we essentially try to bring the transcendent aspects of their personal religious faith to bear in overcoming the secular obstacles to peace. And uh, in the seminars, uh, we, we go into things very deep, like wounds of history, uh, but one of the key elements in the whole thing is the whole concept of forgiveness. Uh, when you think about it, it's, that's largely dismissed by the real politique crowd as being a very simplistic concept and not something anybody in their right mind would do. But when people come to understand it's not about letting the other person off the hook, it's about freeing yourself up from the need for revenge and hatred and all the rest of it that then uh, goes down to your children and your children's children and pretty soon you've got people doing things as they were in Bosnia over something that, despicable things to their neighbors over something that happened 600 years earlier. 
So this forgiveness business is really something. And I'll never forget in one of the initial meetings of the, uh, uh, the indigenous core group that we had on the Muslim side, where two Muslims were talking about how they, as a result of the seminars, had now been able to forgive the perpetrators uh, who had caused uh, deaths of members of their immediate families. And one of the gents, it was his son. He had tears coming down his cheeks. And uh, so it was very genuine, very real. And, and, and that's kind of what these seminars do. I've never seen one that did not end with the people embracing and uh, a lot of tears and the rest of it, because it touches hearts as well as minds. It's the kind of thing that uh, I went to once as a participant myself just to experience it firsthand. And I guarantee you, you can't undertake that and not come out a, a bit of a changed person. So the uh, lesson learned there was uh, uh, that that's an, that can be an effective instrument for winning hearts and minds. Uh, but um, well, one thing we really failed to do, and I don't know that it was so much a, a, a problem of our own making, but something that was endemic. But we, didn't, we were not able to get the track one peace process to capitalize on the goodwill that we were able to establish at that next generation level. And I think it's largely because even though during the six years of our involvement there, uh, that uh, there, were, there seemed to be some genuine uh, track one movement, but uh, in reality, that it really has never taken hold. And I don't think it ever, probably ever will, because Kashmir is for India and Pakistan, just as Palestine is for the Arab states. You know, if you've got problems at home, you just fan the flames in Kashmir to take people's minds off it. And of course, for Pakistan, it justifies their huge military uh, uh, complex. And in India, you know, if they were to ever let Kashmir go, it would be a hugely difficult precedent to live with because of other states with similar separatist tendencies. Uh, final example I'd like to share with you is in Pakistan, <coughs> where we spent uh, seven years on the ground uh, reforming the madrasas, you know, these religious schools that gave birth to the Taliban. Uh, most of us in the West are not mindful of the uh, very illustrious history of these schools. If you read uh, about them in the media, you get the idea they're just seeds, seabeds of terrorism and a caveman-like mentality. But back uh, in the Middle Ages through the 16th century, they were without peer as institutions of higher learning. It was only European exposure to them that led to our own university system in the West. And you would be astounded at how many of the traditions and mores uh, right here in the University of Massachusetts and just ac and across the land uh, are modeled after the madrasas. You know, the, the mortar boards and tassels you wear at graduation, funding a chair in a given discipline. This all came out of the madrasas, but we've totally forgotten about it. But in reaction to British colonialism and some attempts to start secularizing them, uh, the Muslims were fearful of losing their Muslim identity, so they purged themselves of all subjects that were de deemed to be either Western or secular in nature to the point where the vast majority today are about uh, rote memorization of the Quran and a study of Islamic principles. And our goals there have been twofold. One is to expand the curriculums to uh, include the physical and social sciences, but with a very strong emphasis on human rights, particularly women's rights, and uh, religious tolerance. Uh, second is to transform the pedagogy to create critical thinking skills among the students. Uh, you find that we're sort of born with those in the West, but in these tradition-bound tribal cultures, there's not a lot of room for it, so they certainly don't emphasize it. Uh, <clears throat> and the, uh, at this point, uh, after seven years of working the problem, we engaged some 2,700 different madrasa leaders from uh, 1,600 madrasas. Sounds like a lot, it's really not. There's 20,000 madrasas, but all the ones we did were in the very radical areas and we felt like we had the momentum to take this across the country. Uh, we, uh, excuse me while I see what this hook says that I have to respond to. Two minutes more, okay. All right, very briefly. Uh, and I think that, uh, well, we got to a point where at one point I sat down with our project director who deserves the 90% of the credit for all the progress we made over there. And I said, from this day forward, I don't want to ever mention our center's name in Pakistan again. I said, we're too widely known and we're too targeted. 
Uh, and um, it was three days later that a seven-page online jihadist journal article came out that went to all the cells in Pakistan and Afghanistan specifically <laughs> targeting our work. Uh, the good news is we're having an impact. The bad news is we're having an impact. <laughs> and uh, so what we did, fortunately, we, uh, we had put in place two years earlier the legal framework for an indigenous NGO that we would one day staff up and pass the baton to because our job is always to work ourselves out of a job by building capacity, not dependency. And so we energized that, uh, let our project director go. He became the president of that foundation. Uh, he's one of the peacemakers of the year uh, recipients. Uh, and um, we uh, got some good office space in a discreet location. Uh, and um, it's, uh, we didn't miss a beat. And in fact, the State Department, which had been opposing our work some, for some five years, finally came on board and put up a half a million dollars of funding to support the project work. Um, we also did some, there are countless anecdotes, but I want to just give you one, uh, uh, because strategically what we were trying to do was deal with the ideas behind the guns. You know, bombs and bullets have their place, but more often than not, they uh, spawn more terrorists. So getting at the ideas, I think, is important. So back when the Taliban had taken over the Swat Valley uh, and heads were rolling, uh, we had a workshop for 16 madrasas surrounding the Swat Valley. Toward the end of the workshop, one gentleman stood up. He was a madrasa leader, but he also happened to be a commander in lashkar e taiba which is the terrorist group that brought you Mumbai. And he said, uh, I came here for one reason and one reason only. It's to discredit everything you have to say. He says, but I, I now find myself standing here full of rage, rage because for 26 years I have taught, uh, studied and taught the Quran the way it was taught to me. He says, I now feel after this experience that for the first time I have sensed the soul of the Holy Quran and its peaceful intent. I now see that the way to advance Islam is through peace and not conflict. I'm gonna change what I teach my students and I'm gonna tell them why. Pretty brave thing to say in mixed company in that arena. I suppose he got cut some slack because he was a terrorist commander, but, but we come back a, a month later, and sure enough, he's doing exactly as he said, and we had a CNN team with us. They had been after us for several years to document our work, and he said it on CNN, for God and the entire world to hear. So it was a, a pretty, pretty brave uh, thing, but this, this, this is part of getting at the ideas behind the guns. In a context in which religious legitimacy trumps all, the best anecdote for religious ignorance is religious understanding. So lessons learned, uh, why did we succeed? Uh, these are the positive lessons. Uh, one is uh, ownership. We conducted these in such a way that the madrasa leaders fe felt it was their reform effort and not something imposed from the outside, which means they had a lot of ownership in the change process, and they came up with good ideas. Second, we inspired them with their own history, not just their institutions, but going back to the early days of Islam, when so many of the pioneering breakthroughs in the arts and sciences uh, uh, took place under Islam, including religious tolerance at a time, I might add, when Christianity was woefully intolerant. Uh, when they, the more they hear this, the more they internalize it, the taller they walk, the more they start thinking, hey, maybe we can do better too. Uh, third, probably most important, is we ground all suggested change in Islamic principles so that they could feel they were become, becoming better Muslims in the process. And then finally, not something we talked about much, but we operated from a posture of total humility Humility driven by our awareness that it was the United States that was very complicit in planting the seeds of jihad in the madrasas in the first place. We were trying to grow holy warriors to evict the godless Soviets out of Afghanistan. So the Soviets left, and then we left, and now we're back. They're doing what we trained them to do. They just ch changed targets. So this begets humility, if you will. Uh, some, uh, the other uh, lesson learned there, I did, had not anticipated this, but I think if you go in with the notion that you're one, gonna one, a day, one day come out, uh, uh, getting that legal stuff, uh, which takes a long time uh, to uh, establish an NGO or at least identifying one that you think you will one day be able to pass the baton to, I think that was a good lesson learned. Big picture, two things. One is that uh, in Pakistan, there's an elephant in the room nobody talks about. It's the fact that despite the democratic trappings, it's fundamentally a feudal society. 
And the people on the top are not only not interested in empowering the people on the bottom, they want them to stay there because they see life as a zero-sum game. And I don't know if this is a carryover from the caste days of India or what have you, but that is the reality. And that's why you see when you look at uh, percent of GDP devoted to education in the world, Pakistan's always near the very bottom. You know, the military say, takes all the resources. But I think it's pretty deliberate. They like to keep the population as Ill illiterate as possible so they can't vote and that sort of thing. Uh, and then finally, I think, is uh, getting back to that uh, strategic piece. I said the State Department uh, had been imposing to us. And they finally, I think the reason they came around is they finally recognized that what we were doing with the madrasas was more strategic than anything else that was going on on or off the battlefield. You know, and, and that opened their eyes and finally uh, we, we got some good support. So I think uh, those are as uh, very quick and dirty uh, and uh, I hope that's helpful. Happy to go into greater depth during the questions and answer. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Doug, do you have any suggestions for the academics who are present here today about research issues that have emerged from your work that might be addressed by academics in this field? Well, uh, there, is, there is a project. Uh, we'll learn this uh, month if we're going to get funding for it or not, but the uh, project will involve uh, mapping the uh, spread and impact of jihadi Salafism around the world, figuring out in those countries where it's taken hold, why it has, in countries where it's failed to, why, it, why not, and uh, coming up with a strategy for how to best uh, contain it, if not reverse it, and the violence and instability that accompanies it. Uh, at the heart of it, though, in terms of what our center wants to do, we want to look very hard at the nonviolent strains of Salafism to see if there's not a way that we could start marginalizing the extremists, uh, help them do that. So. There's about 12 different countries uh, where we will need very deep research to, to carry this out. So uh, open to any ideas that any of you have. We've identified the countries, but uh, if you're interested in this sort of thing, uh, we might be able to put you to use. Thanks. Thank you. Our next presenter is Andrea Bartley, and uh, he's listed in the program as the new dean of the Seton Hall University School of Public Service, but he's probably here in a different capacity, and that is that he's been a long time representative of the San Egidio community in this country, and as you probably know, San Egidio has been active in religious peacemaking for many years in many parts of the world. So, Andrea. Thank you. <coughs> nice to be here, and uh, I'm going to present some slides, so I hope that they will come up. Soon. So um, it was it's wonderful to follow um, Joyce and Doug. Um, we started working long ago before Joyce joined the Tannenbaum. There were conversation on what to do, how to address this issue, and one key point was to learn from practice. And I think that that process has continued in many places. So the logic is fundamentally is that there are many people doing many things all the time before we study them or before we recognize them. And I think that it's a very important assumption. This is true for many things in life. We do things before we understand them. We walk before we understand our walking. We talk before we understand our talking. And there is a very different cognitional effort when we try to explain what we do just because we have done it. So one thing is to speak, and one thing is to be a linguist and try to explain the speech that you're using. So I think that the role of academia is very important at this juncture of where the general field of conflict resolution is, because I think that humanity is actually trying different ways. Many people around the world are trying different things. And we have the capacity today to observe, document, understand, in a way we didn't have before. And one of the reasons is because we are less constrained by national bias. We can look at cases and say to ourselves, these are actually human cases. These are cases we can relate to independently of boundaries that were created way before. 
So, <clears throat> I think that uh, when we look at efforts worldwide to address religious conflict and promote interfaith dialogue, we need to look at a widespread differentiation. If you look at what happened in Ukraine, and at a certain point, in the middle of the clashes, you see three monks going around with the icons and stopping the violence just by walking through. What a wonderful gesture, where that came from. How do we explain that so far the whole thing in Ukraine has been relatively calm, incredibly calm in many ways? Well, probably there is something about the experience of an understanding of the potential of people doing things that they saw doing in the Philippines when Marcos left, that they saw in Solidarność when the Soviet Union collapsed. Many things happen many where, and I think it's important for us to keep learning. So David spoke about my association with the community of Sant'Egidio. I am the representative of the community to the UN and the US since 92, long time. Been around for quite some time. And I will focus simply on a few cases in which the community of Sant'Egidio have been involved. Realizing, though, that the community is rarely active in interfaith dialogue in the direction of peacemaking. We do a lot of peacemaking work, but different than Mohammed and James, you know, that have this interfaith dimension at the core of their work, the Community of Sant'Egidio work in peacemaking is just peacemaking. It is religious because we are religious, and we often engage with actors that are themselves religious, but we rarely approach the peacemaking through the idea of helping a dialogue between different groups to make the peacemaking happen. And yet, we are definitely fascinated by potentials and, as I said, experiences that were in front of us. One in Algeria. Uh, Sant'Egidio was able to negotiate or to provide the space for the negotiation of the platform for a peaceful resolution of the Algerian crisis in 95. Uh, nationalists, socialists, and Islamists came together uh, all Muslim coming together in a Catholic convent in Rome was a fascinating project, I think, recognized by many as a lost opportunity, but in many ways a very interesting way to also <laughs> see responsibility for a European Christian legacy that is attached to many countries around the world in ways that, he, that is uh, appropriate to revisit. And what was interesting in Algeria, uh, a good friend of Doug, um, John Kaiser, wrote a, uh, wrote a book about the seven monks killed in Algeria. Um, many of you may have seen the movie of Gods and Men. Christian de Charger, one of them, writes this beautiful testament, and is clearly calling for a form of dialogue that is almost mystic in nature in which we are going to encounter each other at the end of time. And what does this encounter look like? Is an encounter made of violence? Is this encounter made of judgment? Is this encounter made of hostility? Or is this encounter made of hospitality and understanding? Yeah. Our work in Nigeria clearly follows what uh, the imam and, uh, and the pastor have been doing. But it's also, interestingly enough, connected to the very reason of the state to be. Why do you want a Nigeria? Why is Nigeria supposed to be together? That and is here, and I'm sure that has grappled with this question long and hard. Many states are the result of post-colonial uh, world order rather than processes of people coming to terms with their own construction. Bosnia is a case in point, you know. Does Bosnia exist as an independent country and why and how you can keep together Republika Srpska when the strength of the bonding that keeps the country together are so weak? Well, Sant'Egidio did one of the few interfaith interventions that was this dialogue among the three um, um, Abrahamic religions and uh, it was definitely a contribution but definitely not significant insofar the state itself 
doesn't bring about a peaceful um, um, political space. Central African Republic, we negotiated the agreement of the Pac Republican exactly to create a space that would allow for the polity to be represented properly so that the people themselves can participate fully. But what I would like to present today, in addition to Sant'Egidio, is the work of the Fetzer Advisory Council on Forgiveness and Governance. We will have a gathering in Washington in November um, because we were compelled by episodes of people being forced into prison and being capable in prison to think long term polities that were able to represent all. So Mandela is a case in point. You know, Gandhi is a case in point. King is a case in point. Many of them killed by uh, others that were not happy with that proposal. But it's interesting that we are recognizing an invitational capacity of that forgiveness logic. Forgiveness as a gesture of uh, um, freedom that liberates collectivities from the burden of the past. There is a blog about this. And so what I would like to focus, speaking about Sant'Egidio and Fetzer and the work that I saw um, coming from those who have spoken before me is around four themes. The first is friendship, this human bond that allows people to move beyond the constraint of enmity. And we know well how friendship is actually a very arduous path for people that have been in enemy camps. It's a very difficult movement. And yet when it comes, it's extraordinarily liberating. The second is gratuitousness. And again, the freedom that comes from doing things without being paid, without having a transactional relationship and having this capacity for freedom that is not just for those who are doing things, but for those who are involved in the enmity process that are invited into possibilities that they would not consider otherwise. The third is faithfulness. There is something very important about calling with Coney and his people, even though they're on the run. And I understand that many would disagree with this statement and would prefer actually for Coney to be dead. But we do believe that there is a space in personal conversation that is transformative in nature even when this is only a potential. And so in gratuitous friendship, the faithfulness enables conversation that would be unthinkable. For those who want to believe this and want to explore this further, please watch the movie Enemy of the People. It's about this wonderful journalist in Cambodia that takes upon himself to discover the perpetrator of the genocide in Cambodia. As you know, nobody was persecuted in Cambodia. Everything went under the rug. And uh, in this context, this young man went on looking for those who killed thousands. It took him years and years of gratuitous friendship having an ice cream and something to eat, a radical hospitality, to create the conditions for the perpetrator to come to terms to what they did and confess and speak and tell the truth. There is something extraordinary that happened when we allow life to be served in friendship freely. And what happened is generativity is this emerging of life in conditions that we would have think otherwise impossible. We saw this over and over again. Sant'Egidio is now working on Casamance, you know, the longest uh, uh, war in Africa. We are working in Mali, we are working in many places, but the process that we see over and over again is that when you are committed faithfully over time, gratuitously, without having an agenda of your own, without earning money out of that doing, then generativity happens. We saw this on prisoners that were freeing others. I mentioned them before, speaking about forgiveness while they were in prison. We see this in this research that I'm doing with uh, a student from Yemen asking uh, Saudi 
uh, scholars their opinion of John Paul II's forgiveness of Aliachka. So you have this Catholic leader that is almost dead because somebody tried to kill him that forgives the, the, so, the, the assassin. Is this a sign of weakness? Is this a sign of silliness? Is this a sign of craziness? Or is it a sign of an authority and power that is actually a gift to humanity as a whole? What is the reading of uh, people in the West, of Abdel Kader, this wonderful gift of uh, somebody who resisted secular, violent, colonial France? And then, once it was conquered militarily, went to Damascus in, ex in exile and saved 5,000 Christians out of hospitality. What are the learning that come from actual experiences? Well, we need to realize that every time there is a, con a conflict that is destructive, you have power, meaning, and relational structure destroyed. What is really um, uh, to be addressed as the fundamental construct. And so when we think of research initiative, I really hope that we will focus on power, meaning, and relations, that we will see how people are actually repairing them in the aftermath of um, a protracted enmity system. Personally, I have a hope that people will engage, especially not only in intra-faith dialogue, but also in not in interfaith dialogue, but also in intrafaith dialogue, especially around killings. Jews have sp stopped killing each other long ago, not completely. You know, Isaac Rabin was not killed by a Muslim. But definitely there is a, a very strong taboo around the idea of killing another Jew. That's not the case for Muslims. Muslims are killing Muslims in major numbers. And Rwanda was the most Catholic country in Africa at the time of genocide. So I do have a, relig I, I do have a re research question about the usefulness of religion or the relevance of religion when religion can be either set aside and be totally irrelevant or be manipulated in such a way that you can have a massacre of that kind. We are, we are re remembering now 20 years of the Rwanda uh, genocide and I don't see the conversation on trying to understand what happened. So in addition to the um, uh, interfaith dialogue, I would strongly recommend to launch research. And so in that sense, the Salafist uh, conversation that Doug was saying could be a very interesting one. So thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Our final presenter is Rodney Peterson, who is executive director of the Boston Theological Institute. Rodney. How do I set up the screen? It's a pleasure to be with you today. I represent 10 theological seminaries in the Boston area. And what I would like to do is, first of all, affirm what my colleagues have said, but also present something of an evolution of a deepening self-consciousness from ecumenical to interfaith to interfaith just peacekeeping, uh, which is alert in all of the schools of theology in the Boston area. If I can do this. We'll see. There we go. Um, first of all, I'd like to affirm the fact that we're living with a very different lived experience from our forebearers of even 50 years ago, 25 years ago. Our deepening sense of interrelationship with people of other religious faiths is a reality, is a lived reality today in many ways. For the Christian community, there was something of a paradigm shift 
that went on between the Edinburgh Missionary Conference in 1910 to Tambaram, in which the Western enterprise turned international, in which relations to other faiths became deepened, in which there developed a kingdom-related as opposed to church-related theology. This has led to four aspects of interfaith education, which you can see in the 10 schools of theology here in the Boston area. But first of all, I'd like to affirm the importance of a growing movement of respect for one another, which is evident. The importance of respect or dignity has been held recently by political psychologist Donna Hicks in her book, Dignity, Its Essential Role in Resolving Conflict. If we were to trace something of the evolution of theological education in the Boston area, much of the shaping of the mindset behind religious peacemakers, I would turn first of all to the importance of this, of this establishment of the Center for the Study of World Religions at Harvard in 1964. Then the continued work of Diana Eck and the Pluralism Project and the current demographic work on the part of Gordon Conwell's Center for the Study of Global Christianity. A second and deepening uh, relationship is to listen to guest lectures and sponsor appointments. So not simply talking about the other, but beginning to listen to the other. Hiring of faculty persons outside of Christian traditions is a practice at most of the BTI schools and is an increasingly an important reality. This leads to engagement in, interf in interfaith study together. For example, the Scripture Reasoning Project encourages the practice of Christians, Jews and Muslims and people of other faith to study their sacred texts together. An example of this is the Center for Interreligious and Communal Learning at Andover Newton Theological School and Hebrew College. Uh, and a recent hire is Muslim scholar Celine Lizio by, the Cir by Circle made possible from a grant from the Henry Luce Foundation. And finally, a fourth deepening uh, self-consciousness of the importance of interfaith just peacemaking is this uh, further uh, emphasis upon working together for justice and peace. We might say that this effort began to grow in recent years around environmental issues as a common area of mutual endeavor with Thomas Berry, an early advocate. More recently, Susan Thistlethwaite and associates have raised up concern for relating interfaith issues to just peacemaking in the book, Interfaith Just Peacemaking, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim uh, Perspectives on the New Paradigm for Peace and War, or a book on formation for just peacemaking, which is recently out as well. These four aspects of a deepening trend in, inter in, in interfaith education are going on throughout the United States. What we see here in Boston is a microcosm of much of this development, and this is very important for the evolution of the peacemaking efforts that have been described by this panel today. Furthermore, we might look at four religious topics that frequently are addressed on a path toward reconciliation. An iconic book that gives vision to the liberative and interfaith journey, uh, work on a journey toward reconciliation is No Future Without Forgiveness by Desmond Tutu. I emphasize these four religious topics because they are religious in nature, not simply secular topics. These topics demand that the religious community, whether Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Buddhist, or whatever, is brought to the table for interfaith just peacemaking. First of all, of course, the importance of liberation theology. Since Gustavo Gutierrez's paper toward a theology of liberation in 1968 and its embrace by Latin American bishops in Medellin, Colombia, liberation theology has shaped a preferential option for the poor. And this has extended beyond Latin America to Korea, India, and elsewhere throughout the world and in other religious traditions. This is a major innovation in the 20th century one that is reaching into the 21st first century and shapes our work as religious peacemakers. Secondly, forgiveness theology. This again is a deeply religious concept and demands that religious peacemakers be at the table of international relationships. Andrea spoke a little bit about this. We might talk about the work of Lionel Narvez and uh, another Latin American who takes as his departure for liberation, for forgiveness theology, the work of liberation theology, 
but then shows its significance for human rights by taking forgiveness out of the pew and confessional and into the public square through the schools of forgiveness and reconciliation. Lionel Narvez has been a UNESCO recipient, prize recipient. He is credited with training over 90,000 people in training the trainer type programs in the, in, the, in the country of Colombia by the government itself. He's credited with reducing the level of violence significantly in that country, as are the schools of forgiveness and reconciliation in other regions of the world. Restorative justice, again, is another concept that I could go into in terms of its religious significance. We know of its legal significance, we know of its communal significance, but the early book reflecting on restorative justice by Howard Zare, Changing Lenses, underscores the religious nature of this. And so also just peace. Since the World Council of Churches inspired decade to overcome violence, the World Council of Churches has increasingly embraced just peace as an alternative vision to conflict transformation and in distinction from theories of just war and pacifism. Just peace interests can be seen to have been developed out of and in relationship to restorative justice themes. Each of these four topics demand that the religious community belong at the table of conflict transformation. Then we could talk thirdly about training in religion and conflict transformation. There is a need to make conflict transformation central to ministerial training and dialogue with issues of local and global security. Increasingly, this is advocated in many places, such as the Croc School at Notre Dame, George Mason University, and elsewhere, as many of our, our panelists attest. Some motivating theorists are Mark Gopin, who argues um, about the importance of dialogue with the most intransigent in matters of local or international conflict. Abdul Aziz Sachadina, who argues for global reconciliation in line with human rights norms. Miroslav Wolf, who offers a consistent bias in favor of inclusion. Raymond Helmick, who argues in Fear Not, Biblical Calls for Faith, that based upon the premises of monotheistic faith, we are encouraged to seek out the other in conflict settings in order to draw forth their best position. And so we could talk about the array of authors in Douglas Johnston's book, Faith-Based Diplomacy. Technical proficiency is needed in addition to theoretical proficiency. I'll simply skip over this in the interest of time. But again, as I've tried to emphasize the evolution of the ecumenical Christian community in this direction, I need to raise up a document affirmed at the last World Council of Churches Assembly in Busan, Korea, Christian Witness in a Multi-Religious World Recommendations for Conduct, affirmed by the World Council of Churches, the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue, and, and the World Evangelical Alliance. And some of the principles, for Christian witness at least, are given in these 12 points. We could talk about the importance of interfaith centers, the Tannenbaum Center, the Interreligious Center of New York, theological consortia like the Boston Theological Institute, councils of churches to interfaith councils or issue-oriented associations here in Boston, the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization and the Refugee Immigration Ministry are both splendid examples of propounding a roadmap for peace. Finally, if I were to develop in the time remaining a roadmap for ecumenical and interfaith ends that have research implications, I would raise up these five points. What is the importance for each of our traditions of natural versus revealed theology? What is the place of dialogue in each of our communities? Or very importantly, what is the nature of the community we wish to create in the United States and throughout the world? Or again, is there purpose in religious diversity? Or what of the significance of narrative and propositional theologies? Narrative theology is the story of my life. Propositional theology is something more objective and rational and worked out by theologians. Each of these five questions each underlie the significance of the topic that draws us together today, particularly the significance in place of dialogue. 
or the nature of community, the nature of the community we seek to create. This conference and these comments and a panel like this is held on the 100th centennial anniversary of the outbreak of World War I. And I could not complete these remarks without citing this statement by Margot Caseman, former bishop of the Lutheran Church in Germany. Peace was also an issue at the time of the Reformation. The reformer Philip Melanchthon, who died 450 years ago, was seen as a naive dreamer. His vision, dismissed by many at the time, was education for all. For Melanchthon, education always meant education for peace. He understood it as the capacity to use reason to seek arguments in our agreement in conflicts. Peace education is a basic element in a creative approach to peace. Children can learn to resolve conflicts without using violence, but they will do so only if adults make a determined effort to show them how. What I've tried to do in the few minutes that I've had here is to talk about a certain evolution in consciousness, particularly within the Christian community, but then as that community has influenced other communities globally, around the importance of ecumenical education, interfaith education, and then interfaith peace building, a central component to what draws us together in this conference on bridging global religious divides. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rodney. We're almost out of time, but maybe we can take an occasion to uh, ask two or three questions. So. Anybody want to start out? Over here. No. Can't see. The light's in my eyes. Thank you so much, everyone, for the very insightful, thoughtful presentations. I want to ask a question about the nexus between conflict and health. In our PhD program in global governance and human security, we're looking at linking issues um, like conflict and gender, conflict and health. The health effects of conflict and violence uh, are profound, either direct or indirect. And I'm wondering if you have thought about or have included um, certain types of interventions or research um, that may create opportunities for individuals that you engage in conflict settings to access things like psychosocial support, social workers, um, to address issues around post-traumatic stress disorder or anxiety or depression. Um, so coming from a public health perspective, these are important interactions and you have the opportunities to engage them and I'm wondering if you do through your, your research or your practice or your programming in any form. Thank you, anybody want to, Rodney? Just I'll, I'll say a word quickly, uh, especially around the concept of forgiveness. There's an incredible amount of psychological work that's been done in the Boston area, throughout the United States, worldwide, in the psychological value of forgiveness in terms of liberating one terms of the health benefits. I mean, there's much that we could cite, and I'll leave it to my colleagues to add to what I'm saying. I agree with that. I have a more complicated response on health, uh, particularly based on the Mozambique experience. Mozambique was uh, terribly affected by the violence for 16 years, and then when the peace came, the mortality went up significantly because the uh, HIV AIDS virus had conquered the refugee camps and when people went back, they were happy, they were having sex, children, and all the children were actually um, affected by, and so you had an enormous mortality, an epidemic that was caused by the peace, not by the war. If the, if the war had continued, more, many people would have actually survived. So peace and health and conflict are a little complicated, especially from the public health perspective. And I would say that we need to uh, be conscious of that complexity, that to equate 
conflict with post-traumatic stress disorder is a little bit of an American take. Um, I think that uh, for many, um, the problems connected to war, the problem connected to peace are enormous in scope. And I think that uh, universities have the capacity to tackle that complexity today better than 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So I would say that religious community can be challenged by this, and uh, I'm not sure that religious peacemaking in particular may have the instrument to um, contribute to this but I would agree that forgiveness as a psychological contribution is an important one, but I would strongly encourage everybody to be more evidence-based, uh, uh, driven when we speak about health, and the usefulness of a societal uh, complex system approach. David. Uh, David Steele, Brandeis University. I first want to thank all of you uh, for wonderful presentations and um, a lot of very, very practical uh, as well as academic understandings and experience. I, I sense this theme that was going through a lot of what many of you said. I'm actually going to use some of Andrea's language, but I think I heard it from all of you. Uh, the need for commitment over time, um, faithfulness that reaches out to all, even including perpetrators, uh, intended to change, transform. Um, I also heard his word was uh, being gratuitous. Um, in other words, doing without pay, whereas Joyce, you're talking about the need for pay for peace builders. I think that's an interesting um, contrasting statement. But I guess my basic question is, what, what's, what's the future? Um, particularly when you look at the need to not only build relationships, which many of you are doing so well, but as Doug was talking about, how do you impact um, long term? How do you deal with impact on structures? How do you, can, how do you have sustainability? If you're really going to have commitment, faithfulness, a gratuitous approach, how do you do this over time um, when we're so bound to donors that give short grants and so forth? So it's not just about money, but how, how, what, what's primary for us? Before we take answers to that, uh, Imam Ashraf, why don't you ask the last question and then the panel will respond to both. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, my questions are in twofold. The first one is to the, uh, our brother from Center for Religion and Diplomacy, and of course, Andrea. With your experience at the United Nations and very close to the diplomatic community, what is the, really the reality why the UN agencies and members of the diplomatic community still become skeptical of giving religion the ability as an instrument to facilitate reconciliation or in terms of peace making? We know peacekeeping have been a very negative things and have not yielded the desired result. But in peace building or peacemaking, why is religion not being used with so much investment in trying to find a solution to that? And that informed the second question to my brother in theology and madam, is that today, most of our academics, authors, writers of books, they are not being, majority have been written negative, negative, negative about religion. And they are always condemning religion have any positive role to play in the modern social sphere of life today, with a session of very, very few. Now, what is the motivating factor? And what can change this paradigm? Initially, we know religion has no role to play. It is not there. Religion is dead. But today, it's on the, as a big monster in the forefront. And what really, why, what should be done here? to change this paradigm that the authors will be writing about the positivity within our religious traditions and be able to expose those positivity that will change the mindset of so many people around the world. Why, why, why? Thank you very much. Doug, why don't you respond? Can you give me a, perhaps a question? Yeah. Yes. 
Uh, I, I will attempt a, an answer here. The, uh, I think the negative attitude toward religion that you find in many, uh, particularly in government decision-making circles, has to do with its uh, past identification as being a uh, part of the cause of conflict more often than part of the solution. Uh, all of the major world religions, as Joyce well knows, uh, at the heart of them, they're about neighborly concern and the betterment of humanity. But uh, unfortunately, religion is uh, all too often co-opted by power politics. And uh, it's seldom the cause of the conflicts that we see in the world today, but it is often a badge of identity or a mobilizing vehicle. And so one of the responsibilities that all of us bear is uh, calling our religion back to its roots. And I think that the more uh, the um, decision makers of government and the like see instances where religion has played a very helpful role, uh, I think you're going to see this trend reverse. And uh, we're also already seeing it a little bit in the U.S. government, although it's taken 15 years to get there, at last they have a, an office that's about religious engagement. And it's a Band-Aid solution where major surgery is required, but it's a start. <clears throat> you know, yesterday, there was this uh, concern expressed about, or the question was, uh, are we more about democracy or uh, stability? And I think that could be translated to a, a uh, contest between uh, national interest and values. And to my way of thinking, just about all of the uh, experience I'm aware of, uh, national interest will always trump values, okay? And when we were doing our work in Pakistan, we had the drones on the one hand, <laughs> which sort of represented national interest, versus what we were doing, which we thought represented values. And finally, the realization took hold that the values actually trumped the national interest in this case, and that's why State Department's now supporting that. But when all of this began, and David, when you were uh, a part of the uh, writing of that first book, Religion, the Missing Dimension of Statecraft, in 1994, and it was putting out the call for governments to understand uh, religious potential, to reinforce it, to build upon it, never try to own it, because that would discredit it. But I think that's finally starting to happen, and I think the more that happens, the more acceptable uh, religious inputs will become. <clears throat> I totally shared the view yesterday expressed by the reporter that religion needs to be at the table in these peace processes, particularly in the Middle East, if not at the table, at least one off, because otherwise you've got no ability to deal with the religious issues that come up, and the, and the politicians are totally incapable of dealing with them. So I think there's a lot at stake, uh, but I would be more optimistic and less pessimistic about the future. One of the things um, that we might want to consider is the power of the story and the uh, ways that people get information so that they begin to think differently and, and, and perceive things differently. So that goes not only to our success stories, but how we communicate them. And it well might be that to really build this field, we also need to work with our communications experts and those who study marketing and communications because we need to make the story of the positive use of religion and religious peace building one that is accessible to everyone and not only to those who somehow end up in this room or watching a webcast of this uh, discussion. I'd just add one more PS, if I might, David. Uh, one thing I find great encouragement about in terms of the government part of it is uh, we've been involved on the ground in Syria working with the opposition leaders at their request to help them reconcile their differences. And we've been conducting faith-based reconciliation seminars to do it. We've done five of them, but the last three have been funded by the State Department. To, to have this bastion of secularism 
funding faith-based reconciliation is quite a leap. So another note for encouragement. Rodney. I'm not going to touch the question of the perception of religion. I think that's a complicated issue, and I'd be happy to talk about it on another occasion. But I do want to talk about David Steele's question of long-term sustainability and commitment, because I think that's absolutely crucial. Most religious communities were in a region before the conflict. Most religious communities remain in the region during a conflict, and most religious communities will remain in the arena of the conflict 80 years after the conflict. So the question of long-term sustainability is a very important question. I think there are probably as many churches on street corners as there are bars on street corners in Boston. And with that perspective in mind, I would like to see each mosque, church, and synagogue become known as the Neighborhood Center for Forgiveness and Reconciliation. I think in that kind of, uh, with that kind of an emphasis, that the, the, the feedback on that is how do we train our future religious leaders? And that's a very important question in my mind as we go forward with peace building throughout the world. The, the question on uh, the skepticism of the UN agency I think is very palpable, I think is very true, but it's also true in many government settings. So it's not only the US, UN system, and the UN as a system is a, is a club of states. And mostly states, especially on the donor side, are very skeptical of religion. They come from different traditions, but I think that the work that Doug started, you know, in reimagining ways in which religion can actually be uh, understood and, uh, and welcome as, a, as part of the solution is an important reframing. But I would also uh, like to stress your role because I think that uh, I was touched when uh, a few days ago we had a delegation of the Imam, the Archbishop and the pastor from Bangui coming from Central African Republic and going to the Security Council. So you have a Security Council in Aria Formula and welcoming them to address the crisis in Central African Republic. My reading when I saw them speaking was this could not have been possible without Mohammed and James. And thanks to all, you know, initiative of change and all those who have supported you, as, as, as uh, uh, Joy said before, you know, you were not known, now you are known, <laughs> but you are known in a good way and people say, oh, but this is actually possible. So the same way people learn from the Philippines, the same way people learn from Poland, people are learning from Mohammed and James. And when I see the Pope calling them, this trio, you know, this Archbishop Imam and the, the pastor, you know, the Saint of Bangui, well, I like the idea that the Pope, instead of doing crusades, is calling them the Saint of Bangui. I like the idea that the leadership is actually moving in that direction. I think that there is a shift in consciousness. I could not have gone into Rodney's church if I were born 50 years ago. Literally, we would not have been friends. So we are part of a different moment. And I, so in that sense, you know, back to David's questions about the future, I would say the future is now. And it's actually a very interesting future. It's a much, much closer future. It's a, it's a future where we can meet. And I think that we should be bolder, actually, in trying to encounter each other, speaking more, welcoming more, you know, rediscovering hospitality, which is a, actually, I would say, probably much, much better preserved in Muslim countries than anywhere else in the world. But without hospitality, we are going nowhere. We are simply not. We are not going to be able to survive as a humanity, as, as a family of one. If I can add as a, ta a trailer to what you just said, uh, since the year 2000, there have been many more UN authorized religious lobbying groups. Prior to 2000, there were very few. And I think this is also a mark of the growing influence that people accord to religion and its positive role in politics. Let me just add a word about the UN question. When Kofi Annan was the Secretary General of the UN, he 
invited religious leaders from around the world to a large conference at the UN and uh, looking to the role of religious leaders in peacemaking, and the conference was a disaster. The religious leaders were chauvinistic, they were nationalistic, they were promoting their own religious interests, and it led to a very negative reaction within the UN. And I think as both uh, Rodney and Andrea have said, quietly over time, there have been more activities underway of increasing understanding, things being done under the radar. So I think there's a momentum building for religion to be a more positive factor in UN circles, but it's, in a way, it's overcoming the negativity of the initial large effort that, that backfired. So I want to thank our panelists and uh, thank you and uh, we'll move to the next session.